before we start, I am so sorry I'm not updating more than once a month. School is taking a toll again, but I am really happy to see more subscribers dropping in and I really love doing these type of videos. So I will continue to try and make at least one video per month for you and for a while I will keep focus on the Viking Age and the religion. And possibly also more about the Viking women and an extended view of gay and transgendered Vikings during the autumn. I am right now working on a bachelor paper where I am planning to do a queer reading of the Icelandic saga Hervara Saga och Heidrix. And before I forget it, please subscribe, comment and like the video and also share it if you really like it so more people can find me. It really means so much to me to be able to take a break from the school books and read your comments. Now, let's talk about Frey. We have already talked about his sister Freya and I have included a link to my video about her here. So, let's see what we know about the brother. One that sometimes is seen as a male side of Freya and sometimes is seen as standing on his own. He, just as his sister, is one of the three Vanir that we have knowledge of. Hey, Captain! He, just as his sister, is one of the three Vanir that we have knowledge of. Vanir was one family of the gods, while Aesir was another. The Vanir and the war between them and the Aesir is handled in my video about Freya. So I will not go into it so much here. As usual, we find a lot of different variation for his name. Many of them used in Old Norse poetry where there was a need to use figure of speech, so-called kennings. Kennings was needed to keep the poem's form and rhythm. The most common names for him is Freyr. Frey in modern Swedish and Frey in modern English. Other names he has are Yngvi Frey or Yngvi, which he has in the Ynglinga saga, a saga that tells of how the Norwegian kings all came from his and the giantess Gerder's son Fjölnir. In this video I will mostly stick with the modern English version, that is Frey. Frey was the son of Njord, the sea god that also probably stems back on an older worshipping of the goddess Nertus. During the Viking Age, the worshipping of Njord seemed to have taken a bit of a step back in many areas, and instead his son Freyr got a more prominent position. When it comes to Frey, we have one of the more clear signs in the old sagas that part of the cult leaders could have been women. There is a story in the Flata book that is about how an Icelandic man Gunnar Helming have killed a man and thus has to flee. He flees over to Sweden and starts a cult together with a Gudja, that is a cult leader for the god Frey. This story is pretty humoristic written and is probably written to make fun of the heathen Swedes. But it has enough similarities with archaeological findings and other sources to point towards that both women could be cult leaders and that Frey seems to be connected to the older Nertus worshipping something where his father Njord as well as his sister Freya also is strongly connected to. During the Viking Age, Frey became one of the most important gods. His name means Lord, and he is mentioned in Abraham of Bremen's text about Uppsala as one of the three gods there that was worshipped, and it seems that he indeed had a strong cult around Mälaren, which included Birka. It wasn't just in Uppsala and Mälaren though that he had his cult, and we can again see this in the many names around Scandinavia for different places. Norway and Denmark both have a lot of names for places that means some form of cult place for Frey. Frey is the god of harvest and fertility, and such he is strongly connected with sexuality. Miniature pendants and statues where a huge phallus is very prominent have been interpreted as connected to Frey or being statues of him. Adam of Bremen mentioned in his description from Uppsala how the Frey statue had a huge phallus. I know I have earlier said that Adam of Bremen as a source is problematic because he wasn't really there himself to see things. And also he had a very strong focus on describing the Vikings as hedonistic animals that needed to be saved by the word of the true god. 
But in this case, other sources do back him up, and the number of small statues also calls for that this description might not be so wrong. Frey, as all the other gods, has his own big mansion to live in. The name of his house is Alfheim, which connects him to the Alfer, a collective of mythical beings we do not know that much about, but that seem to be connected to the burial mounds and the dead ancestors. This also connects Frey, as well as his sister Freya, to the worshipping of dead ancestors, and I really wish I could give you more details about this, but sadly the sources doesn't tell us much more than this. One prominent part of the cult around Frey is that he is the god of peace. The term Fridir, which means peace, is a word that comes back in the sources many times. In Lokasenna, Frey gets a good word from Tyr that tells that Frey does not offend or abuse women, and he set prisoners free again. This gives us a new perspective of the Viking Age people. While Odin and Thor are warriors and pretty violent, Frey is a god of peace, love and understanding. Which means that the ability to swing a sword or kill your enemies wasn't perhaps always the most important. Frey himself seemed to be more occupied with making sweet love and establish and keep up peace than to go to war. Maybe he was the other side of the Old Norse people, the non-warrior side. And this gives us again some food for thought about if the Viking society really was all that brutal that we earlier learned it was. That picture comes from sources that was not friends with the Vikings, the French and the English sources. And that picture of a brutal, manly warrior is also very much a construction of the natural romantic academics during the late 19th century. Vikings were violent. Many of the merchants were slave traders, and a big part of their economy was based on slave trading. That is not what we modern people would call a peace-loving, nice, hippie people. But, on the same side, it doesn't seem that all Vikings aimed for a life as a warrior. And Frey, since he is not just a god for the farmers, but also for the leaders of the society, is definitely a strong contender as a sign of a more peaceful life during the Scandinavian Late Iron Age. Frey has a special ship. It is a magic ship that you can fold down so small that you can keep it in your pocket. This ship is both a connection to his father Njord, the sea god, and as a symbol of fertility. Ships have been used as a symbol for fertility even before the Viking Age. There are a huge number of stone carvings around Scandinavia from the Bronze Age where ships are a very common motif. Frey's ship was given to him at the same time as Luke gave the other gods magical gifts. So it is made by the same dwarves that also made Thor's hammer, Sieve's golden hair and Freya's Brisinga necklace. Frey is a god with the total opposite type of animals and symbols around him compared to Odin. While Odin is surrounded by scary animals like ravens, wolves and an eight-legged monster horse, Frey has a golden pig named Jullenborst and more normal horses. Pigs have also been connected to fertility since way back in the history, which isn't strange because pigs are a really economical and excellent animal to keep on a farm. They give off plenty of meat and doesn't need big farmlands to give them stuff to eat. Mostly they eat what humans leave and what they can find themselves in the forest. Jyllenborst is said to draw Frey's chariot, and pigs was one of the things that is said to be sacrificed during the autumn and midwinter blot. We do eat ham for Christmas here in Sweden, but the connection between that and Frey's Jyllenborst, or Valhall's pig Särimner, is a bit unsure and highly debated. There is no mention of this ham until the 17th century anywhere as a typical Christmas food. And the now traditional way to make the ham is probably a German tradition. Yeah, Tommy. Before the Germans get there. But there is an older tradition to slaughter pigs around Lucia, the old calendars Midwinter and Yule. 
and thus the only time of the year you had a chance to eat fresh pork that hadn't been salted or dry was most likely during Christmas. What the more common folks ate though was probably not the ham but the ribs because the ham was a rich man's food. Also the concept of Yule before 17th century was not too focused on food. The expression was that you drank Yule. The most important part of celebration was to drink huge amounts of ale and mead. Well, I go more into this uh, in another of my videos about our Christmas tradition, so let's leave it there and go back to focus on Frey. Because Frey doesn't just have Gyllenborst as his animal, he are also connected to horses. Horses have been connected to wealth in the old Germanic tradition, and in Ravnik Freygudis saga it is told about holy horses that was meant for Frey, and that it was forbidden to ride in any mundane errand on these horses. In the saga there is a faithful servant that goes against this and rides the stallion Freyfaxe and thus gets killed as a result. The more known story about Frey where he gets to have the main stage is the previously mentioned Ynglinga saga. This saga stems from an older poem called Ynglingatal and it tells about Frey, Yngvi Frey as he is called in this saga, falling in love with and marrying the giantess named Jard. He sees her in the hall of Odin and experiences such a strong feeling that he sends a servant with extraordinary gifts to her and asks her to marry. The gifts are rich, among them there are 11 golden apples and Odin's ring Draupner that drops 9 extra gold rings every night. There is also a magic wand with magic runes. Gerdr isn't so interested in the gold, but the magic and the runes gets her to agree to meet with Frey. They indeed do, and the result is the son Fjölnir, that later become the founding father of the family that the Norwegian Vikings king stems from. To claim family ties with gods is nothing new in the world. Kings and rulers have done that since, well, as long as we can trace them back into history. There has been a hot debate among religion historians about if the cult and the ruling system in Scandinavia was connected and thus that it was a society ruled by a sacral kingdom with a divine king. A divine king is seen as godly, a god on earth put on the thrones by the gods to rule in their place. Two of the most prominent professors I have read books by, Gro Steinsland and Olof Sundqvist, seems to agree with each other that the society was not ruled by a divine king. He was not a god reborn, nor was he put on the thrones by the gods, but that he was surrounded by mythology around his long-lasting ties with both gods and giantess, to put out how he was special and thus more suited to rule. It strengthened his position as a ruler, and it also meant that he also had his place in the ceremonies and sacrifices. There are even theories that because of this, during particularly hard times, this king needed to be sacrificed because he was so close to the gods. Because of this very close connection to the higher power, both Steinsland and Sundqvist still wants to call the Viking Age society a sacred kingdom, even if the king wasn't viewed as a god himself. So that was what I had to say about Frey, the god with the golden pig. A loving, peaceful god that seemed to be very important in the Viking society and that might give us a bit of a new insight in said society that is often very focused on just their warriors and manly men. Frey was not into that. So, well, hope you enjoyed it.